I just want to take a minute to uh, recognize the end of The Good Wife, uh, Juliana. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Very well done. Uh, so you're, we're two, we are now two weeks away from the finale. How does it feel? I mean, it's, it's been a long and wonderfully successful show. It feels very surreal to be finished. I, I, I keep thinking I'm dreaming and I'm gonna wake up and have to go back <laughs> to a long day. Um, but it feels good. I feel like they honored what the show started out. It, I think it's very rare to be able to, on network, start a character out and stay true to her for seven years. Um, and I don't know, we'll see. It's a, it was a, it's a, a, as, as someone said on set, it's a cable ending. It's not a typical network ending. Um, so I loved the way it ended, but I don't know how the audience will feel about it. Did you have any say in how it ended? Like in what her, how her journey would end? No, you know, I really respected the writer's vision of the show. And I, I would say in, out of 156 episodes we shot, I maybe called them six or seven times to just tiny little tweaks, but never wow. a full story line for, for my character. Um, they were great people to work with. It was a really collaborative, good experience. And 156 episodes, are you gonna go on vacation? <laughs> <laughs> you know, in my mind, I'm already on vacation. It's just a mental, uh, I feel much lighter in my brain, just not having to, to learn so much dialogue and, try and show up every day and, and make every scene count for something. After a while, it, it can be, it can wear on you, but when the writing's that good, I always feel like you can only be as good as the writing, so um, I feel lighter, and, and I, I am enjoying having some downtime, That's but great. I honestly don't know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> I, I mean, I organized my sock and underwear drawer, and I felt really good about that. <laughs> First time in, oh, First you time need, in right? seven years. Yeah. <laughs> really good. Ford Coffee, listen to NPR. Find no socks, one was at me. Socks from eight years ago. Um, yeah, so no, I, I keep saying I'm going to buy a pair of really big overalls and uh, put my hair up in a schmata and wear some Birkenstocks <laughs> and just go up to my house in the country and do That's nothing for Birkenstocks. Birkenstocks. <laughs> Birkenstocks. <laughs> earth, those Very earth authentic. shoes. <laughs> Not those shoes. You're no, not hang out no, I don't shoes. want anyone touching me for a while. Do you think, you, do you think you'll keep dreaming of, about the character for years to come? That's a great question, Tom. Um, I, I feel very connected to her yeah. in many levels. Um, um, but she also probably, yes, she probably will haunt me for the rest of my life. Right, yeah. <laughs> she had some dark places to go. Um, but she's crawling out. I, I feel like I left her strong. So we'll see. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, she started out so weak. Well, that was what, what I was thinking when I was looking at uh, you guys, it, it, that we have represented all sorts of different kinds of shows. We have miniseries, we have uh, anthology series. It's like, but the one thing that unites you guys besides crime, which we can talk about later, <laughs> is that yeah. the characters are very complicated. I mean, one of the hallmarks of this television renaissance is that you get characters who are not one thing or another. They're not good guys or bad guys. They're, you know, even when they are bad guys, they're, you know, they're, they have some sort of essential humanity, or even when they are heroes, they have like sort of you know these things that they're that they're dealing with. So I I would love for you guys to each talk about the characters that you were playing this season and and how you managed to like kind of balance those often contradictory uh, characteristics. Mm. Well, I just call the writers and say stop adding sides to my character. <laughs> 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 it's great, right, to play to get to find another dimension of a character. It's really great. I, I don't feel like some people have asked because Saul Goodman in, in Breaking Bad was such a uh, one-dimensional, sort of intentionally, uh, guy who was a facade of uh, that he was presenting, you know, to his in his business effort, uh, and so I didn't feel like it was a lot of work to get these new sides to the character when he was Jimmy McGill. Uh, like to try to marry those two up and and I just love uh, all the interesting uh, versions of the guy that there are just like real people I mean you're one way at work and you're a different way with your family and 
on your own you're a kind of a different person and it all made sense to me right away it wasn't so hard. did you approach jimmy as as a separate character from saul uh -huh. I mean, you, yeah definitely. so you didn't have yeah. like here i have to yeah get no to i here. didn't think about that at all mm -hmm. because I, we all knew like right away when we talked vince and peter and i well who is this guy because who really wants to watch saul goodman for any length of time i mean he's <laughs> he's a apparently lots of people <laughs> well, I know, but he's not Saul Goodman. He's he's right. the guy behind Saul Goodman. I mean, the actual Saul Goodman is presented in Breaking Bad was just a selfish, self-interested. Uh, he was fun to watch in short increments, but you wouldn't really want to build a show around him. You'd immediately have to find other sides to him. So they they just sort of threw that away and built somebody from the ground up. Um, so yeah, I didn't think about it. I didn't. It wasn't a big deal to me to figure that stuff out. I just approached the script for Better Call Saul from a fresh, completely fresh place. And I was a little concerned that the audience would give us that chance. But I didn't even think about that until uh, it was too late. <laughs> I didn't think about what I was, what we were mounting until it was too late. <laughs> because it's showbiz, you know, anything can happen. Take a, take a chance on something. But when the billboards went up, then I went, Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should really have thought about that. <laughs> Watch that. Uh, I hope they like it. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Gene? You played, you know, this the crime mom matriarch, uh, sort of accidental because her husband yeah. has been felled yeah. by a stroke, and yeah. so she's having to take over. How is that? Well, first of all, I love the fact that her name was Floyd, and oh I never God. asked. I know. Noah Hawley, why he named her Floyd until we were done. I came up with my own notions of why he called her Floyd. Excuse the laryngitis, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> but the thing I loved about her was that she was just a very practical person. You just do what needs to be done, no matter what. And so when, her when she had to take over for her husband, it was just sort of, well, that's just what you do. And, and Noah had laid the character out so well that I kind of had a great backstory for her almost right away but like in the second episode there's a scene where she's in the kitchen basting a turkey or something and her son is out in the barn doing um, shall we say enhanced interrogation on a poor fellow <laughs> and I'm sure she knows what's going on but it's just sort of but then he comes in the kitchen later and, and, and makes a dirty joke and she you know bites his head off for using Maybe crude language right. you know and she was you know, she's, I don't know, she was old school and she was a rancher. She was a rancher's wife. She grew up in, on farms and ranches and hard times and worked hard from the time she was a little girl and probably had a very strong father. She had a very strong husband and she just, you know, you just do what needs to be done. And if, you know, you need to do certain things for the business, you just do Did it. you know what her fate would be when you started? No, I just hoped she'd last as long as possible. I was hoping that I would take a lot of people with me at the end. I really wanted to go out in a blaze of glory and take a lot of people with me, particularly Kirsten Dunst, but I didn't get to do that. <laughs> well, I thought, you know, towards the end, one of the things that was great about the performance was you could see that she realized at a certain point this was not going to end with a win. This yeah. was, you know, so it was about yeah. just sort of... It, it, yeah, it almost started when her son, who just could never keep his mouth shut, in I think it was even episode four, she she thought he had pretty much gotten them all killed just from his not being able to control himself. And was yeah. that the first time you've been stabbed to death on camera? Oh, I believe so. Just Sorry, just spoiled. Well, I, I didn't know. Spoiler. Oh, my God. Mary, Mary, Mary. Oh, no idea. <laughs> all right, well, you guys can cut that. that. Disappointing. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. It's your job. I have yes. this rule. If it's been on national television. Uh, no, you're right. You're right. <laughs> right. Okay. We're just behind. That we're and so I really behind. wanted to know. It was like, <laughs> no, it that was, was quite the, a... Yes, that, that, was, that was the first time. It yeah. was... Uh, how well, was... I, and, I, and I, I Googled, you know, because you know, people die so quickly, usually in movies and TV. They get, they get shot anywhere in their body, and it's like, boom, they're, they're gone. They're out. <laughs> yeah. They're gone. There's no, you know, and... And even if they get stabbed, all of a sudden they're dead. But apparently, you can be stabbed in certain places where you die almost instantly. For, for instance, if you're stabbed in the diaphragm, you die instantly. 
It's oh, just you a can't really breathe. strange. I don't know. It's a strange thing. But um, so I thought about that. But also there was that whole thing of she can't believe that. That this has happened. Who's doing it is doing right. it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we won't spoil it. Thank you for that. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And we're Please to allow us that this. little surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to It's like you can stream it. <laughs> well, no, okay. I know. I will not. I'm not going to make this. Okay. You've okay. already and made Not all of us point. have finished our shows. And, uh, we don't have I'm really sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's what I'm going to be doing now that I'm free. Is I always forget that the people who, who make TV don't watch TV because oh. you guys are too busy making TV. We don't, but now I was three episodes in. Thank right. you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now it's I'm a lot of really cool stuff okay. happens. It's going to be in the family, that. isn't it? I can, I can <laughs> answer questions about antiques. You've kept it in the family. I'm telling. I can it's I feel I, can I watch feel Dora it. the Explorer. I don't know about you. That's, <laughs> yes. that's, that's about my Being level of TV heroes, with my yeah. daughter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what is up with Dora? What about Ray? I I think you know you 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 talked about uh, Renaissance in television, and it kind of feels to me like uh, you know a lot of these these cable shows are are, are, are catching up with classical drama. The the root of great dramatic writing is conflict and duality. I think, you know, yeah. you look at, for me, that's the sort of defining brilliance of Shakespeare is that to write a, a play like Merchant of Venice in an essentially very anti-Semitic period of England's history and to, to not be able to resist writing hath not a Jew eyes, senses, affections, emotions. And I think that uh, the anti-hero, certainly for the past five for so years in television is making great strides. Um, and I think for actors, it's really interesting to, to be able to play duality that, that you know, um, I think for so much of my career, I, I played typically bad guy characters. And um, part of my thinking behind it was, well, he's not such a bad guy, he's sort of a normal person with a mother and father who has hopes and dreams and aspirations that somewhere along the line went wrong by society's standards. And that's, to me, that's the best writing because it digs into that conflict that we all feel as people going through our lives, that um, things don't always go the way you want them to and you don't always behave the way you know you should. Um, and I, I, for me, that's that's certainly what I enjoy about uh, about the writer's work on Ray Donovan. Do you think? I mean, does he think he's doing the right thing all the time? I mean, one of the things that I like about his character is you do see his conflict play out. You know, where he's like trying to figure, no, I shouldn't. Have, I'm screwing up, and then he does it again. Do you know what I mean? It's like I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it again. I think the, the the central premise of the character is that he's a survivor <laughs> of abuse. And uh, I think that that uh, survivors or people who have been abused tend to fall into patterns of behavior, um, and it's very hard for them to get out of. But I think one of the things that I that I really admire about Ray is his, um, uh, and maybe identif I identify with on some distant level, which is this desire to do the right thing, um, and, and how profoundly unequipped he is to do the right thing and how um, vulnerable he really is. And that little bit of irony about violence, because in some respects it's a pretty violent show, but that, that uh, violence is a symptom of fear or vulner vulnerability. So uh, the depth of someone's vulnerability usually allows you to predict the scale of their violence. Mm. Um, uh, and that aspect of the character, particularly when you look at that noir model, that very masculine mm -hmm. noir model of what is a man, and uh, the way that Anne created that and David has continued it is, is a really interesting model to me, um, certainly in terms of what's expected of men <coughs> in contemporary society and how they behave when things have shifted so dramatically in the socio-political world. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. That is a good segue to you because your character is a, is more of a classic hero, but he's a very reluctant. Like he has, when you meet him, he has removed himself from that world, yeah. from the world of violence, and he's like he is the night manager. This you know kind of against yeah. the 
wallpaper as much as Tom Hiddleston can be part of the wallpaper. <laughs> but it's a, <laughs> oh, but I he's can, very quiet, me. and and then he is he makes a decision to uh, get back in the game of yeah, I th justice well, ish. I think that's the way the way Jonathan Pine is written by John Le Carre is so true to the spirit of Le Carre. Um, which is that they're, all of his heroes are damaged. They are kind of, they're never straight, um, straight laced. They're always haunted by a kind of fragility or a moral ambivalence, um, a, a sense of the hypocrisy of having to do bad things for the greater good. And um, I love that actually. I love that, that um, Pine is, is a former British soldier who's seen so many terrible things in in as as in the army in the second Iraq war of 2003 and that somewhere inside he's on fire but he's so ashamed and he feels so guilty that he's hidden himself in a different kind of service hiding behind the anonymity of uniform um, and then what happens in episode one without spoiling anything <laughs> is uh, is he's compelled to 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 join um, the Secret Service because he's so he feels so passionately about the need for justice. Um, it, it's it's such a I think it's such a Le Carre um, trope in a way is to show that the world is is not actually divided by good and evil. Is that there are characters who sort of exist in a liminal space between them and that Hugh Laurie's character is a very charming man and you love Hugh Laurie because everybody loves Hugh Laurie um, but he's playing someone who's billed as the worst man in the world and so as a reader and as an audience your sympathies are, are tested because you know there's w you're supposed to be on one side of the line but, you, but evil is so seductive or, or the face of evil is so seductive in a way. Um, I loved I loved playing Pine. Um, I felt very connected to his uh, to his anger. With w a bit like what you were saying, Liev, about about um, there are two kinds of people in the world. I suppose there are people who are courageous enough to do the right thing, and then there are people who just step back from the edge when push comes to shove. And I'm very moved by people who. Who, who are brave enough to do the right thing. Um, and he's, he does something I don't think I could do, which is surrender his identity um, and become a spy, to, to live without the privilege of intimate relationships, um, to be invisible and anonymous. And if something happens, he's a dead man, um, simply because he believes that, that anyone who's had the privilege of of, of any Western democracy, British or American, if they do something as cynical as selling chemical weapons um, to the highest bidder, then they should be stopped. It's an amazing premise. Must have been fun though with you, Laurie. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> A lot, I mean, the best yeah. scenes are when the two of you are like dancing around each other. Yeah, well, that's the thing I suppose is, is I think Le Carre understands that that, um, that, that that in a way he wrote the best villain for Hugh, which is there's this incredibly cynical, very um, very dark character who is well, the devil plays the best tunes, I suppose, and and he's so charismatic and so charming, and he invites Pine and the audience in, um, and Hugh is um, Hugh's able to pull out all the stops in a way. Um, he loves this book too. He's loved it for 25 years, and he wanted to get it made. Back in the day, he he wanted to play my part. <laughs> I, how uh, was that? Really? Yeah. You, you, were you worried, like when you were doing it, like would he have done it differently? Well, no. He was very sweet. He was very sort of you know, very hue about the whole thing. He said, said, "Well, you know, hair falls out and knees get creaky, and what can you do?" And <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but he was he was just such a great champion. Of, of the material. He would be on set even when he wasn't called because he loved it so much. Uh -huh. um, and he's so um, so charming and so rigorous and intelligent 
um, and it was odd how the because we only shot I mean compared to you guys we shot it quite recently we shot it last year and it's it's about the um, those shady characters behind closed doors who are doing um, you know very lucrative deals making a lot of money out of the innate rottenness of or the, the cynical side of the world and 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 progressively every headline in every newspaper has, has seemed to sort of you know the Panama Papers released mm -hmm. and yes. it was it became the night manager felt like you know small fry compared to what was happening there and um, and he um, that's why he loves it that's why Hugh Laurie loves it so much I think is because it feels so resonant and 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 contemporary Alicia obviously did not go through quite the like you know shadiness that some of the other characters have but she certainly has like grown I mean when we met her she was the good wife she was very dutiful she was and then it was like and then it was over now what do I do with my life mm -hmm. and she has grown and especially in the recent you know in in recent seasons we've seen her make you know very like confident but often very self-aware decisions in a way that she didn't before how is that I mean did you which was harder to do the the more sacrificial, where she was like unsure of herself, or well, it, the it's it, what's been interesting about playing both those sides is that they do a lot of flashbacks. Um, at least they did in, uh, I think it was season five, where she had already come so far, and then they did these flashbacks to when she first started out trying to get a job, and her husband was in all the papers, and she was in all the papers, and she was trying to rise above, and it was sink or swim, because she had two children to take care of, and her husband was in jail, and the money was gone. And you sort of, to, to watch her remember, she's making a speech um, at a luncheon uh, and for women, talking about opting in rather than opting out, sort of the lean, leaning in um, ideal. And she to play her and even to put on the clothes and the different wigs to be Alicia before she became someone who actually I feel um, it was it was more fun to play her later only because she just didn't care anymore when she was the good wife she cared what everyone thought she had this image and lived in a bubble of what she was supposed to be for everyone else but herself and then she, when all of that happened she she said a beautiful speech in the pilot episode when she's she's defending this young girl um, she says don't turn on the television and don't read the papers you need to be a Teflon pan let it all roll off of you nothing anyone thinks of you or s says about you matters all that matters is you know the truth and there was something about that that was sort of a springing board for her to jump into her own life and say right screw what everyone says about me or what they think about who I am this is who I am. So yes, she makes decisions, I think, that were it was a slippery slope between ethical and non-ethical <laughs> choices at times, but I think there's this defiance in her at a certain point where she is sort of saying, screw you, everyone, because doing what I thought I was supposed to do doesn't work very well, mm -hmm. does it? So I'm going to go this way. And that's what made, uh, Jean and I were talking before about what, what's so scary about signing a huge contract as an actor is the idea of saying, if this show goes, I'm going to play the same character for seven years. Yeah. But what was so wonderfully challenging, and, and actually I felt like I got to dig deeper as an actor, was I was playing a character who was constantly changing. Mm. So I never felt like I was playing the same character. I always felt like I was growing and moving with her. And it taught me a lot about myself as, as a woman changing and moving, and my circumstances changing in my own personal life. You sort of get to draw on all these incredible insights that you do as you get older and more experienced in life. And so it was a great challenge. I never looked at it as mundane as one could. You can phone in a performance. I know we probably all have, but um, I always felt like it was every day, no matter how tired I was, it was a challenge to step up to who she was becoming, you know? It really is a great time, I think, to be acting in television because uh, you you see the notion of what you're allowed to do and what is permissible on a serial character growing right. and a lot of these writers are doing really pioneering work on what 
you can do uh, and what you can say and the, the, the level of duality and the level of conflict and the humanism that's in so many of the characters, it's, it's really, it's a... Well, and it is the luxury of television is that you get to play it out for a long time, unlike a movie. Yeah, where exactly. The I was just going to say and where end. that's in the later you go, oh, why did I? Why didn't I think of that? Right. Then now Being it's able done. to work on things that are issues in your life, especially when you stay with something for a long time, and and you get to know the writers, and the writers are bringing things that are real to them, right? To the script and mm -hmm. and substantive. It's, uh, it's, it's not as bad as, you know, I was terrified too when they said sign this. And I said, well, the reason I became an actor is so I didn't have to do the same thing all the right, time. Right, exactly. This is the right. last thing I want to do. <laughs> right. But now the characters are, are you know, if, if you're fortunate enough to yeah. have a good group of writers and a, and right. a, and a good well, piece of Well, I suppose it material. isn't the same thing, actually. What you're saying is it's, you think you sign up for something that feels like it's going to be the same thing for a long time. Yeah. But actually, it isn't. It, isn't right. it, it changes and it grows yeah. and it. Well, develops. even 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 doing a play where you literally are doing the same yeah. lines right. every performance, but you do find so many as it goes on, you find all these new things in the character that you yeah. think, oh, why didn't? I wish I could go back to opening night now because I, yeah. I've right. thought of all this wonderful stuff. The only scary thing I find about a series is that is, is that um, you won't. As an actor, obviously, you want to be as specific about your character as possible, but at the same time, you, you're, you think, well, if I kind of do this, there's no, no going back. If I sort of set this up as a precedent about the character, mm -hmm. I can't just suddenly say, oh, that didn't work. I don't want that to be part of her character. It's too late. You've sort of, because you don't know where it's going. You know, you have no right. idea where. Where at least with a movie, you know exactly what's going to happen. That's the great thing about a pilot, though, is most of the time you're just oblivious. Right. <laughs> you, you go in. Yeah. You have no idea down. that you're setting the footprint yeah, for the next six yeah. years of your life. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Has I mean the the different you know forms of the uh, of series now you know where you're doing ten episodes or you're doing six episodes and it may I mean there are rumors that Night Manager may go to a second season may not. Um, you know, uh, a lot of that's what happened with Downton Abbey. That was a miniseries that then became a series. I mean, is that does that affect you as an actor? Does that make it easier? That, you know, where you're not doing as many episodes, or where where you know that there's well, it could be this or it could be that, or is it is, is that more intimidating that the you don't? Fargo know exactly model what it is. is kick ass. Right? The what? Fargo. Fargo. Model. Oh yeah. Different story, ten episodes. Different story, ten episodes, and a little bit of connective tissue and. Uh, who knows what Noah Hawley will do with it. It would be interesting to see if there was maybe even more connective tissue in later Flashbacks. seasons. Flashbacks. It would be really neat. <laughs> and But that, that's fun. I found 10 episodes not quite enough, though. To me, that was, it like, wasn't I was enough. Ask, eating one potato like, chip. Yeah. I, you know, it's were like, you like, oh, kind of like, oh, I wish dang. that this were one yeah. of those. That's words. where it might be interesting to see, uh, not to plant the uh, thought too strongly. I hope Noah Hawley is watching. Which camera, which camera do I look into uh, to see if uh, Chief Bill comes back? <laughs> no, but uh, to see if somehow over, because he's jumping decades, but maybe somehow there's more overlap. That would be really neat. I don't neat. know. I mean, I but, but I think that is a great, uh, that I would like to see more of that as a viewer. Oh, I think. Where you can watch you 10, yeah. whole new set of characters, but carrying over the tone and yeah. the kind of subject matter and the, the the place that you're the the, the themes so and the, the true detective model I, I was just it's kind of true detective yeah. model. See, I'm, it is, I'm it is. really jealous though of the actors on uh, American Horror Story right well that's different they Same. do what ten yeah. or thirteen maybe ten, 10. Yeah. and they get to come back every season but they're playing they're different, different characters, characters. right yeah. so they're like a but they're like a, it's a rep similar notion actors of they just get to just do all these different yeah. shows together it's the voice of the show sort of carries you through but. Everything else has changed yeah. within it. That's really I said really to Noah, I said, well, I, you know, can't we do that? You know, and he goes, he goes it's, been done. it's been done. Oh, oh well, we'll see. Oh, we'll no. see. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> well, maybe he could jump back in another 10 years and do the family before everything. Yes. Prequels. Yes. Flashbacks, exactly. all well, that that's stuff. What we're do that's in what space, Fargo yeah. in space. <laughs> <laughs> After the apocalypse. 200 years <laughs> in the future, the city of Fargo is in space. It's so funny, though, how, the, how that, why, why is it? The name Fargo <laughs> has just sort of, it just sort of now represents that quirky yeah. world that yeah, the Coen yeah. brothers created and Noah has continued, yeah. and it, it doesn't really mean, have anything to do with the city particularly. It's just. Had a huge influence on the night manager. 
incidentally. Really? Um, that's how Olivia, Olivia Coleman justified her pregnancy. Um, oh, with, because of with, Marge because of, Yeah, because of Frances McDormand. Oh. Um, and she was wonderful. She well, was great. great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was a sort of both Susanna and Olivia went, well, it's Fargo. Right. Um, Good yeah, yeah, so anyway, connective <laughs> tissue. <clears throat> and still with these, especially with uh, the show I'm familiar with, the one I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> wow, selfish. Uh, and what's it called? Fargo. <laughs> Gotta get Sal. Gotta get Sal. Gotta get Sal. I'm pretty sure that's yeah, what it's called. That's, that's what, what people called. yell at me across the street. Um, the 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 length they're able to go with these shows now, and the depth of getting into the character and going down the rabbit hole is crazy. And yeah. we talk about it as actors and how wonderful it is and. But how about that there's an audience of people, how is it that these people are so willing to <laughs> spend so much time with these characters? It's really amazing. I guess uh, people used to read novels and uh, this is where that's all gone. Oh, and the notion of binge watching too, which is kind of a new thing. Yeah. People will watch which is, six, seven episodes at a time. Yeah. It's great, though, because it allows you to keep track yeah. of delicate changes yeah. in story and character because yeah. you don't have to wait and you don't lose it and lose yeah. the story in your head. And yeah. Are you guys aware of that, of the, like, the extreme fan devotion, the, you know, the parsing of every episode, the parsing of every decision that a character makes? And, well, he wouldn't do that or she yeah, wouldn't do that. Yeah, it's a little scary like, because you, wanna, uh, you don't want to break the uh, promise of the... the you don't want to jump the shark in the crude term, you know what I mean, of, of any choice a character makes. It's got to stay true to the person that's been established. But I, you shouldn't read that stuff if you're in the show. I, I don't read anything uh, about me or the show, but, but I, I hear from people how um, the, the attention to detail that people write about after an episode has aired, mm -hmm. down to what I'm wearing, um, what my couch looks like, I mean, they, there's an Alicia couch now at Mitchell Gold. <laughs> I, it's shocking to me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. There, there's, I mean, my costume designer has his own line now, and, and the, the set designer has her own line, and because people started writing in about every single wow. detail. I, I couldn't read it because it would overwhelm me, but um, and I'd never be able to get out of my house, I think, if I ever read anything. But, but I am amazed that, that people are so interested and have the time to comment about it all and that they take it to heart so much. Well, you were, I mean, when you were on ER, you were, I mean, it's not like that, that fandom has always been there where the people The internet's feel, changed since then. Yes. That's what's different. Yeah. So and, and no one The level comment. of, like, literary analysis, I think, also, too. Yeah. Is what you see. The only, um, I've, 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 I walked into my dressing room the day I was leaving, uh, my last day of shooting, and there was this mason jar that had been sent to the production office full of folded, all the same size notes in it with a letter. Um, and it was from a fan club. I, I'm that out of it that I didn't know that existed. But, um, and I read the letter and it said, this is, um, we went all over the world and asked people to write in to, to wish you luck and blah, blah. And in the mason jar was notes <laughs> um, for every episode, 156 episodes from all over the world notes to me, you know, wow. thanking me for the character or saying this character changed my life, I'm in law school now, or I was, and it wasn't just, I, I'm, I was stunned. It was from Syria, Turkey, wow. Greece, Japan, China, where it's been banned, because we did an episode about um, the NSA, anyway, but it was banned there. <laughs> 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 but all over the, the world, and I, I'm in I started reading every, I felt like they put such effort into this, I sh need to read every single one. And I was weeping because I had no idea that this character touched so many people all over the world. And, it, and that's because of streaming and because of, you mm -hmm. know, this internet that we have now. And, and all these people are, part of the letter was about, they're all friends. They all became friends on this website Right. Well, that's yeah. the thing is that you, because they get to have a conversation right. about it, now it, it can matter more because you're not a 
person alone in a room noticing that That's the couch yeah. Yeah. changed right, right. color exactly. when she got the new job <laughs> and, it exactly. and it also fits with the purse she bought and therefore she's making choices. And you, instead of just na now, because they're having There's a, a conversation. conversation about right. that, yeah. right. those, it matters that you notice and somebody yeah. cares and then you can help each other see things. And I know Vince Gilligan and Peter Gould who put this kind of attention to detail into, into Breaking Bad and saw it pay off so well and do the same with Better Call Saul. And I, I certainly don't watch it on a close enough level to catch these things, but when they tell me, it's, it always, <laughs> it's like the it's mind -blowing. Mike, the character of Mike is playing with Kaylee, his uh, granddaughter, with a toy that you see in Breaking Bad. They catch you know, everything. It, it's just amazing. Juliana, do you feel like it changed with every successive season that you did? Do you feel like, the, do you, I mean, do you know now that there was a sort of wave of popularity that was getting bigger and bigger? Or do you feel like you had people from the get-go? Or do you think it got bigger and bigger and bigger and people joined? It's a great question. I, I, because I don't read anything, I, yeah. I would hear that, you know, when it first came out, it was um, it, something about this character grab people. It was yeah. pretty big right away. Yeah. Um, was, um, was, I think it was really, there. we had had so many images of these political wives standing on podiums yeah. behind their husbands. And what what kept it relevant was it was always in the news. Mm. I mean, I would read the paper and go, well, so we're still relevant because it's still happening yeah. all the time. There yeah. was another scandal or another, yeah. you know, and just when you think it's over, Anthony Weiner does it again, right. you know, and so again we'd be Anthony, relevant. So there was this sort of, um, it was a surge in the beginning yeah. and, and because it's so current and the luxury of doing network television as opposed to cable, because I used to ask the writers about it, what they loved about it was they could stay very current. Yes. Because on cable, you never know when it's going to air or you'll shoot them right. all and then it airs. Yeah. But we talked about Trump and Hillary. And I mean, my my TV has Chris Noth's character ran in the in the presidential race against Hillary and Bernie. And um, sadly, mm. sadly, he came <laughs> he came in fourth in the Ohio <laughs> primary. But but we got to stay so current. That's amazing. With, which yeah. is, is a luxury yeah. um, in in network. Uh, I think you made a really good point too, Bob, that's, that's slightly terrifying, but true, which is that this is, it, the, these are novelistic shows. Uh, I was just going right. to say, it is it right. replacing and, reading a book. And, and yeah. it is, these are our novels. This is, you know, perhaps at the turn of the last century, you know, you would all uh, gather around the latest uh, uh, Tolstoy or right. something like that, and now well, they were serialized. Yeah, they were, were serialized. And we were talking yeah. about Anna Karenina, yeah, yeah. like such a it's my favorite book, but so difficult to make, and yet it really it would play wonderfully as a telenovela, yeah. and uh, and um, the idea when the cable market expanded and opened up this sort of world of dense dramatic content that you these shows and it's really interesting because they are I think that, that they do have that in common this kind of novelistic approach to uh, well I story. think it's because you you try to think about what are these stories like and it's very hard to go back 15 years and find anything yeah, right. that's like that even like is like them people often reference movies from the 70s 60s and 70s but even those were still movie um, and it was mentioned earlier how in a screenplay it's it's just going to arc that character quicker than these shows do these shows are more incremental mm -hmm. and offer you uh, an opportunity for more depth and uh, a, a more sensitive reading of the person and, and of their journey and so there's nothing to compare it to except right. those yeah but if you look at novels. a 748 page novel like Anna right. Karenina right. and right. you compare it to the arc of say the good wife Right. Yeah. There are a lot of parallels that you can draw in structure. Someone's master's thesis was yeah. just born. <laughs> oh, yeah? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it's been done. Yeah. Well, and they feel like your best friend. When you're reading a book that you don't want to f end, you don't want it to end, is your, you know, and you shut the book, but you've been living with it for a while, and you've been living with these characters, and then you feel like your best friend just died because it's over. Yeah. And then you look to see what book you can pick up that will have that same yeah. Yeah. feeling. Yeah. I think that's a great comparison. Yeah. It's really true. Um, you don't get to live in a movie. You go in for two hours and then it's over. It's something to do with running time, isn't it? Is that the, the, the length 
and the depth of the length of the time you can spend with these characters and the depth of the writing means that characters can change their minds and and change direction right. which is i think so true of life if we we all know people perhaps ourselves who surprise us with a new direction they go oh i didn't see right. that one coming you know <laughs> and <laughs> themes new, come and go yeah a new yeah. choice oh. a new like people change oh. their minds they say they they stop doing one job and they do another or they a marriage ends and and people split and go different ways and new opportunities emerge and and that's what happens in life is that people people are constantly in constant and that's what keeps it fresh and i right. think well, I've only done six episodes, so I, I really can't <laughs> speak to that. But, but you guys, you know, you've done a lot more. And, and I think the funny thing about it is how, from my perspective, and you probably have a better sense of how this changed. It seemed by accident. It seemed like The Sopranos happened, and, and overnight. that was kind of this yeah. grand and powerful version of The Godfather. So that made sense. But then Mad Men and... And Breaking, Breaking Bad, Bad. And, and where did those come from? And that was yeah. just AMC rolling the dice on something right. subtle and, you know, uh, n hadn't been to kind of related, not really at all related to The Sopranos. That, it just was more of an accident. And then I think it's that thing of like the cable companies and, the, and these uh, networks yeah. realizing, so wait, so people want to see this? What, who there, are there a lot of them? Right. And then, like, and we yes. can do this Amazon too. and Hulu. That yeah. Well, and then I mean, but it every, like it was every more of an cable network did their their premium drama after you know you had right. on like National Geographic, you had it on right. History Channel, you had it on everybody was doing it. I mean, it was a perfect confluence of events, which was that you know you had these digital <laughs> platforms that didn't exist, and then you had social media that allowed people to. You know, right. and, and so when it. they saw right. when the something like, you know, and, yeah. and yeah. Vince Gillian has talked about how Netflix made Breaking Bad because people missed, I mean, the, the you know, they had a tiny viewership for the first season, but people yeah. then went and found it. And then yeah. when they came yeah. back, it was huge. And That's so, what happened with The Good Wife. Exactly. I mean, it's we, like, we it was the first, I think, network show sold on a four platform, multi platform, um, well, I don't know what the word is, you know, multi platform viewing. And it was Amazon and Hulu, and, and all of a sudden, I, I remember the change after season four, after we had done 100 episodes, and they sold it to all the men were coming up to me in the street saying, I love your show. I didn't watch it when it first aired, but now I've been binge watching it. Yeah. Because they can, and it was at, it was at their fingertips whenever they wanted it. And suddenly, there was a whole new audience. And, if they, and maybe they watched it on vacation or something on exactly. an iPad. But it, it's or on what the airplane. You said, yeah, yeah it is, it's novelization. It's, it's, right. If you read a novel and you, for the first time and, and it's been written by an author, you then, you then finish that and you go, what's that what author? Else you what else has he written? Yeah. written? Yeah. And Absolutely. you devour all of right. Le Carre's work or Tolstoy's work or, or, or William Boyd or um, Jonathan Franzen or whoever it is you happen to love. You can go, well, I, now you want to read all their work. And I think the, the box set thing, the binging thing, yeah. uh, which happened, I suppose, with The Sopranos and Mammoth, satisfies that. Yeah. Need for like, oh, I like this tone. I like this worldview. I like what's. I like this vibe, and I want to stay in this vibe. I don't want to go and watch another two-hour movie. I guess. Well, it's also television became something you could have, not something that you did. You know, you could sure. control yeah. it, yeah. which you used to not be able to. And also, then we had all sorts of different forms. You know, you have a six episode. You have a ten episode. You have, you know, Fargo, which is you know just nobody had ever done that before. You had like Sherlock, you know, which is four episodes whenever the hell they feel like yeah, doing it. And true. like, you know, 10 years ago, <laughs> American network executives would say, what the, that's not yeah. going to play over here. You know, you we can't wait three years for them to get free, you know. So, I mean, you just see all these different. So when you have the different forms, then the story becomes the most important thing, you know, right. not filling X amount of whatever, which is nobody wants to hear me talk, but that's like what I, you know, and so, so for, but for you guys to be on the other side of that, there is this like intense um, ownership of character, you know, people, you know, feel very strongly about <laughs> their people and if things go badly for them and, you know, how is that, does that affect you at all as actors? Are you aware of like, you know, this, you know, I think it's energizing. I mean, the fact that people care yeah. mm. is energizing always. I mean, it's the thing about 
a play. You know, you, you do a play um, for a few weeks in rehearsal, and, it, and it's fun in the beginning when the actors are banging it around. And then there's the terror of the, the dress rehearsal and the tech. And then once the audience joins, somehow the circle's completed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And they are the third character in the piece. And it's their energy, and it's their what they put into it, particularly in a live performance. But nowadays, with this internet culture, and this, where you feel a response and you feel uh, a connection and a loyalty from an audience, it's, it's very energizing. And I think it, it keeps you, um, it, it, you know, you can get very tired very quickly on these shows. And, and to know that there are people out there who are hungry for it and, and feel uh, uh, connected to the characters, or, or even uh, in some cases, uh, some of them, some of the stuff that is most moving to me, having been through both Spotlight and Ray Donovan, is hearing from people who are survivors of abuse, and 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 whether or not they approve of what the character does, that they're engaged with it, and and it's making them ask questions and talk and think about their own lives. That's uh, exciting, and, and when the scripts come to you, you then you feel um, that there's a level of import to what you're doing and, and some significance to it, because God knows that it can become formulaic and repetitive, and so to find ways to, to stay true to it or to stay open to it, it, it really helps. Well, as much as you enjoy doing it, even in a bubble, I mean, it's ultimately what the audience, what you get back from your audience that's the most satisfying, you know. I, mean, I guess that's why we all do it for the most part, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we're all middle children, we didn't get enough <laughs> Oh, the puppy that wasn't licked. <laughs> the puppy that wasn't licked. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm going to use it. I am too. I'm just the puppy who wasn't licked. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when you were talking about the anti-hero, which of course was also a hallmark of this, you know, the new you know, uh, television, I, I was thinking about, uh, you know, that was a very male character, and I, I wanted to ask you guys, do you feel like uh, women now are not, from, as a critic, I used to think one of the problems was women characters still had to be likable at a level that male characters did not, that you could accept certain behaviors mm -hmm. in a male character that you would not. I feel like that's changing. Do you feel uh, that that is changing? I mean, that changed with Alicia. I mean, she became less quote unquote more prickly. I, I mean, mm -hmm. she was always likable, but do you know what I mean? Within mm -hmm. the confines of that character, she was less concerned, as you said, about what people thought. Do you see now roles that you're getting that you know? That you well, I think roles there? are definitely, especially in television. I think definitely there are better roles for women. Um, I think, I think a lot of the double standards and just how it is we view men and women, whether that is our instinct or whether we've been programmed that way, I'm not quite sure. But um, it's definitely, definitely improved. Um, it, but it's sort of like comedians. I mean, why is it we accept certain things from male comedians that if a female comedian says or does, you kind of wince sometimes. And again, is that, are we programmed that way or is that just the difference between the sexes, you know? But um, Definitely, definitely. There was better. a great um, Michael J. Fox and I were shooting a scene um, in uh, the beginning of season seven where uh, he bumped into me. I was at a bar and he bumped into me, and I said, "Oh, I, I, my character turned around and said, "Oh, sorry," and he said, "Why do you say sorry? I bumped into you. I should be saying sorry to you. Why do women always apologize? Is it because you're taking up space on on this earth?" And he goes into this whole thing where she suddenly realizes he's right. I'm always saying sorry when someone else bumps into me. And that actually, I kept thinking about that scene and I thought, do I do that? I think I do just in the, just by being a woman. There's something about how we are. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a wallflower at all. I'm, I'll say what I feel, but out in the world as a female, I often, you know, oh, so sorry. I want to be light. Just say yeah. that. Yeah. Mm. You were the that just hit me, in, you know, or on the subway, you know. I'm always sort of trying to, and as he said, apologize for taking up space in this world. And it was a great moment, especially for the character and also for me as a woman to say, yeah, we, we all do that much more so than men. And it sort of gave this allowance for her to then become actually much more 
for lack of a better word, guy-like, in that um, the next time she saw him, she whacked right into him, and he, he, and she just keeps walking, and he says something, you know, wow, you're not the woman you used to be, and she said, you taught me well. <laughs> and she walks away, and you sort of wonder, but does she, is she comfortable there? Is that a, is that a comfort level? And does that level? make her less attractive? Right, yeah. or does it make yeah. her now, now is the audience not gonna like, you, all these questions, and it's just this sort of natural thing, I think, instinct that women have, um, that's an interesting thing to look into because I certainly don't want to be the person apologizing to someone else when they bump into me. You know, I want to be the person who says, you just bumped into me, why didn't you say you're sorry? You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I do think there, there still is uh, writers or, or still don't quite know what to do with women after a certain age because it's like, well, they can't really be attractive, so now what do we do with them? You know, I mean, it's like, unless there, there's there's a real strong character there, for instance, like Floyd or something, but it's, I still find that most roles for women my age, you are, you are either the obnoxious mother-in-law that is kind of like an uptight Republican no one can stand her, or you are the wild and crazy mother-in-law that nobody can stand, and you wear you know leopard print and always have a martini in your hand, <laughs> and you're not ever really just a real person who is maybe funny and maybe you know just a normal person. You either are, and and I notice all the time in movies if the husband is funny, the wife is never funny at all. She has zero sense of humor, mm -hmm. zero. And I don't see that in real life. I see people tend to be, funny people kind of tend to be with funny people. And I mean, that's what I've noticed. But I mean, I, I just, it's still, I don't know what that is. We had exactly. a lot of response to Christine Bransky's character um, is married to Gary Cole in the show. And they have a very sexual, um, and she's a Democrat and he's a Republican, gun-toting Republican. She's completely, you know, anti-gun. And they have such an interesting relationship and it's incredibly um, sexual. And the response to that was tremendous. Mm. People loved it. And that was encouraging good, to me that, that that was something that, but you're right, it's very rare. I feel well, compelled to add that, that Ray is uh, completely Ann Bitterman's creation. And knowing Ann, who I think is a brilliant writer, uh, uh, Ray is a, uh, uh, it could only be written by a woman, and it's funny that it's this become this notion of uber masculinity, but it's completely <laughs> a female creation. <laughs> and uh, knowing Anne, that Ray, in so many ways, articulates her center and sort of philosophical core, and is very interesting to approaching the character from a female perspective, knowing that it's from a female perspective. Mm. I'm not so. I think that's good. That's good also, to hear. It's also good to, good to remember that wi women are writing in a different way now, yeah. um, uh, or are uh, are able to write in a different way now. Um, that, that's well, because so I've never of, assumed that yeah. that men write better for men and women write better for women. I, I would. I've never felt that way. If you're a good writer, you're a good writer. I mean, to What's me. so interesting is that model, which is the noir model, which is a sort of famously masculine model, is so perfectly suited to a female writer. Well, and also you're seeing now more female criminals. I mean, and that sounds yeah. terrible, but so much of the great drama, I mean, you know, how it's four out of the five here, it's like very, you know, violent, there's crime, there's, you know, and that is still like sort of the template for great drama. And women had a hard time with that because they yeah. were victims I think or they weren't. This now year you see on like Better Call Saul, uh, Ray Seahorn, it was kind of her season, that character, Kim. And when she made some choices that made her uh, join the dark side <laughs> or show a dark side, that was, women loved that, mm -hmm. loved it. So it's like, they, the feeling is like, that's what's been missing for women in roles is the ability to play a character or to see a character that it has, um, you know, an anti-hero side to them, mm -hmm. you know, it's, and it's great, you know, it's great. And that was, was great about Olivia Coleman. And I mean, she was, yeah, she mean, was not the anti, she was the real hero. She's the heart of the story. Yeah, what, and I mean, there she was sweaty and pregnant and like dressed like yeah. she just picked it up off the floor because it still fit and, yeah. you know. 
It's I amazing because it. in, in the novel, um, that character is a man. Mm -hmm. and, oh. um, and it was Susanna Beer's suggestion and Stephen Garrett's suggestion to change, to change the character to a woman to just reflect the reality of the Secret Service now, which is there are a lot more women in higher positions, yeah. which is great. And Susanna said she had a very short list of one, which was Olivia <laughs> Coleman. <laughs> it's interesting also, it's a, John le Carre writes about this very male world of, of these backstairs conversations that happen in the Secret Service and it was directed by a woman with a woman at the heart of the story. Um, and Le Carre now wishes he could go back and rewrite the novel with really? her oh, really? as a woman. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, and she, it's brilliant. And, and, and sort of to your point, she's an agent runner working out of London um, in a kind of, f on the fringes of the Secret Service. She's got her own obsession. Um, and she just so happens to be pregnant. It, it really is sort of incidental. It's not part of the right. narrative. It's mm -hmm. just, yeah, I'm a pregnant woman, I'm having a baby, but I've also got a job to do. Um, and uh, I think it's amazing that uh, clearly when Le Carre wrote the, the book, that was the, char that was the character, that was his smiley character, the, mm -hmm. you know, the complexity of doing all that agent running. Um, and now anyone who's seen the show I don't think, I can't imagine it as, as being a man. I can well, only the thing is, it used to be that men were the only ones who did things. You know, women didn't do things. They stayed at home. And so, of course, when writers would write about men because mm -hmm. men were out in the world doing interesting things. things. <laughs> and so now that women are doing more, the, the writing is sort of finally catching there's great, up. There's a great scene, actually, towards the end of, of the manager work. Um, there's a CIA operative played by um, David Harewood with Olivia, and they both have to do something very brave, and she says, I'll go. Um, pregnant woman, perfect cover. <laughs> and David Harewood says, that's not a cover. You are a pregnant woman. <laughs> <laughs> she, does it, she does it anyway. But it's, it's a great moment. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, you had Grace Zabrinsky played the oh, yeah. She was, you know, again, like the really crafty, criminal, violent, and she's declared war. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's, that's a part of Anne's culture. You know, I, I, um, I think Anne has, a, uh, a, um, a re as a writer, has a really specific sense of violence and, and anger and inner turmoil and all of those things, you know, that, you know, you wouldn't think of crediting a woman with, but you know, the bag or the bat, and the specificity of Ray's rage, and that he uses a baseball bat, and what happens with the bat, that's all Anne's creation. And I think that's all part of Anne's rebellious spirit and anger and her own inner violence, which you didn't, you don't usually credit those things. Or perhaps fantasy. To women, <laughs> and her fantasy, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I want a bat. But no, she would describe things. To to I remember her, and she, you know, and I, you know, I can't use the language that Anne used here. But she would just describe things to me so vividly, and with such kind of uh, gory detail that I thought, wow, this is really <laughs> from another life. I better do it right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So one of the things I wanted to ask: Do you guys watch your shows? Do you? I know you don't watch television since I just managed to spoil Fargo for you, but do you do you watch your shows as, you know, not, you know, necessarily the dailies or whatever, but do you ever sit down and binge? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah, I watch. I have to watch <laughs> because things change even after we shoot them. So if you want to understand what happened, <laughs> even if you shot it a certain way, yeah. it might change in emphasis or... Well, numerous ways uh, in editing. Mm. I have such a terrible memory, too, that by the time we're done with the season, <laughs> no, I, I watch it. This is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> this is really good. Who is this guy? No yeah. And there's all these other wonderful actors on the thing that you don't get yeah. to work with. Say, and you see Fargo, their scenes and you I mean, go, wow. I didn't have scenes with half yeah. the, the cast. And it was so fun to watch kind of the other half of the show and what was what was unfolding. But yeah, I, when I was doing 24, though, that was difficult mm -hmm. because that was supposed to be sort of in real time, supposed to be in mm. real time. That, that was, because you'd think, oh my God, that big fight we had that was three weeks ago was actually only, 
in the show like 45 minutes ago. I'm not sure I should have done that scene that way. All right, I, I, the script supervisor, I was at her desk all the time right, saying, now when, when yeah. did that happen? Because yeah. you shot it weeks ago, but it was actually wow. like, like 30 minutes ago I or something. About I, that, I tried to watch almost every episode. I think I've only missed a few, but also because I'm a producer on it. And so I felt a, sort of an obligation to make sure, you know, think, if things didn't look right, to say, why was what yeah. was going on with that can we not do that you know just to sort of make keep it on on track and and have a um or same with actors be like we have to get that person back again yeah. and how do we were you always um, a producer on it from the start no or? uh episode three uh season three, three i became a producer yeah yeah um this season was the first time i was paid as a producer um <laughs> Maybe but you what? had a producer credit. <laughs> yeah, yes. uh, and and at a certain point, I got <laughs> that one in on the wire. I'm not interested in a vanity credit. I'm doing way too much work here, so I'm yeah. good. Take my name off unless you want to pay me. But yeah, they they oh. they heard me after some yelling. But um, I I just think it's important if you're going to try and keep something consistent yeah. to keep your eye on it. But it's not always easy to watch. I love it. I'm a fan, and it makes me want to watch other people's shows. Right. Oh, this yeah, stuff I feel is the good. Same way. Right. Yeah. I watch I and I, I watch with the do work of so shows? many people's I mean, work do you, is there. Do you, I mean, I made the joke about people. Well, I TV. never watch television, but I since I've been on Ray Donovan, I've been watching Ray Donovan, and it, everyone said, "Well, if you like that, you've got to." <laughs> <see> <laughs> <that>. <laughs> <laughs> so because I got me on ordered. his show, and you know, and and uh, and then I started watching, and I and I had a talk with Maggie. We had interviewed Maggie Gyllenhaal, and so I had to watch her show. Uh, the Honorable Woman. The honorable Thank you, woman. The Honorable oh, Woman. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. And I that love that, and I thought, geez, there's so there's much such, stuff. There's such good stuff. You gotta be careful, because you uh, spend yeah, a lot is. of time yeah. watching things, but yeah, uh, yeah I mean, it's, I, I watched the first season, and I was like, this is great, this is really fun. And you know, the hooks and everything, I fell for everything. <laughs> so, um, I, 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 I love watching it. And w w with the Night Manager, you said you shot it like a film? So were you able to watch episodes, or did you just wait till it was all done? Um, well, yeah, because it was just a miniseries. We, mm -hmm. It was six episodes. It was always going to be that. Um, and we shot it as a 320-page <gasps> feature. Oh, no, 360-page. So did you get a script? <laughs> so I got, I got I, there were episode, the episode scripts, <laughs> yeah. But it was, um, it was scheduled like a feature, so we, we didn't shoot them. We didn't just complete episode one and then move on to episode two. Um, we, you know, on a Monday morning, we might be starting with a scene from episode five. And oh, so you cross-boarded yeah. the whole thing. You yeah, the entire. Well, because oh, like of they did a lot of people are doing this now. Yeah. Game of well, Thrones did it. Two at a time. Yeah. Episodes. Yeah. Does yeah. It. But, but it, it was to do across four countries. It was it was right. quite intense, especially we did a leg in Morocco yeah. for seven weeks, and I was doing episode one and episode six. Yeah. Right. At the same time, and six was changing because it was the freshest. Oh. We've started to do that too now. And. Yeah. Um, yeah, trying to just keep it's track. But, but so what's nice about that is then you have an entire. I had the whole thing. The whole I had the trajectory. Yeah. The whole yeah. But you'll be shooting, but for instance, <laughs> six with yeah. one with at the one, same right, time so and going from set to set. It's, right. it's a spy thriller in which I I am called by four different names. Um, so oh I, geez. I take on. <laughs> 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 take on. <laughs> like take on. Wait, I have four passports, <laughs> four identities, and and oh, yeah. I tried so specifically to because before it, you say your line, you check your passport. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm, it's um, Tuesday. I must. It be. was with the costume designer. I had all these different sort of outfits to sort of to try and chart the change in the character, and that was Oof. the fascinating thing. Is that it really was apart from being a great thriller. It was a, a, a puzzle. A puzzle about, about identity. It was right. like, to what extent wow. is this what person? Fun. What wow, that's, fun! That's that's a great way to do right. it, though. Yeah. I mean, challenging. Challenging, but challenging. yeah. So because wow. everyone has to believe you. Right. If, I mean, if I do a terrible job, everyone's were like, were they different nah. accents in each one? No, they were. They, they were. Thank God. It yeah, was just, that would have yeah, been. Yeah, <laughs> it was just schizophrenic. <laughs> the Queen's English okay. Um, okay. for okay. all the way through, but um, they were very different. Different hair, though. Different, different hair. yeah, different. Well spotted. Um, but yeah, it, it just um, slight changes in costume and bearing, um, and um, but it, that, it was quite thrilling to map it out. Even though Susanna and I used to, our heads would explode on Sunday mornings because we'd be, we'd call each other at eight o'clock, going, "So tomorrow, 
we're on, we're, yeah. we're, this has just happened and that's happened. Remember, we haven't shot that yet, but this might happen when you shoot that. So remember this yeah. for next time. You have time. to remember what your character doesn't know yet. Yeah. Which is Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. That's when you need a really good script supervisor. Yeah. Yeah. But it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. That's kind of the novelistic approach to production. And then I think yeah. that's becoming the trend with more and more shows is that you want to get as many scripts into the kitty as possible and then approach the season. And we start to do that on Ray Donovan. And I know talking to our DP, who also sometimes shoots Game of Thrones, that they do that as well, mm -hmm. that they get all right. the scripts done, they know where they're going, they know what they need to accomplish, and then they set about it. Um, but I also had the, I had the luxury of a really great novel by John that le Carre. you could always and go back to. I could to. just, like, as a resource, yeah. there's so much backstory. I, w I mean, is it when you do a second season or, a, you know, you've been playing that character for a long time, it, is it there a sense of it when you come back you feel like because you've done the first season or you've done two seasons, you're like, now I'm on solid ground because I feel like I have lived in the shoes of the character more or, or do you feel like? I kind of feel like the acting yeah. is the least important in a funny way, which I kind of like. It's really about the writing and mm. mm -hmm. are they now on, on a, have they, have they, with the last season, launched themselves to a place where they're excited and intrigued to write? Yeah. And that's the, that seems to be the most important thing, because for us to play the characters, it's relatively simple for them to get that mm -hmm. inspiration or that new idea or that new trajectory mm. and have a sense of its wholeness in terms of whether it's 12 or if it's 22 or whatever. Um, when we were finishing up the last four episodes, I, um, for the first time in seven years, kept watching the beginning of the pilot mm. to try and feel what she was feeling then to what she was mm. going through at this moment. And you'll see in the finale, there's, there's some similarities, but incredibly different. And I wanted to see her back then. Mm. Um, and I hadn't seen it in seven years so I was I was amazed at how far she had come but yet how much of her story was still right in the character and I think that's a that's important when you're doing something for a long time is just to main, check in with who you started out being yeah so that mm -hmm. your transformation can be genuine to how it started yeah that, that you can lose your way hair can change clothes can change you know all that stuff characters come in and out of your life but you're that person. Mm. Well, thank you all. This is great. I'm going to release you since you all need to go watch some television. Thank you. Need you. To catch up <laughs> <laughs> with each other's shows. Very excited. And uh, yes. And so thanks again. This thank, was great. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you for all the wonderful hours of pleasure that you have given us.